everybody. Welcome to Bones Collector. Today on Bones Collector, we're continuing our series where Lori and I are playing our way through our board gaming library. So we're going to play a couple of games, two or three games each week and make a video about it and pass it on to you and I hope you enjoy them. Hey everybody, welcome to Bones Collector and today Lori and I just got done playing San Francisco. We played three times in a row. It's not a very long game, so I would say probably what 30, 45 minutes. 45 minutes, I think, is for a two-player is is uh, probably where you're going to end up. But this is a game designed by Reiner Knizia. It came out in 2022, and I keep saying what a great year for board games. But it's just absolutely packed full of great games. This has been the best year in a long time for board games, and this is one of them. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. It's, it's, you know, it's got a decent and adequate box because there's not a lot of weight in it. I thought it was thick. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty nice. And then I, this insert has got, you know, it's got like city buildings, uh, it, which is kind of cool. And these courtyards and stuff. So I thought the box was absolutely awesome. And then each player board is a folding player board like this and it has these different colored rows. And those are city districts that you're going to be placing cards in. Now, all the tokens are nice and thick, and one of the coolest things about it, these skyscrapers that you build out of cardboard are pretty nice. And they got these bushes that attach to them, and that's what holds it together. <laughs> so I was pretty impressed. And I, when I was looking at them, I'm like, I actually like those a little better than the skyscrapers that were in New York <laughs> by Queen Games, uh, the Stefan Feld collection, because in those skyscrapers are just four-sided, they're flat. Uh, this at least has a little three-dimensional look to it. That's got two different levels on the building, and so I thought that was pretty cool. Plus, plus the bushes are attached to them, so I was pretty impressed by that. You got these wooden cable cars that you're going to place on cable car network project cars that are going to come out of the deck. Master builder token for the first person that builds a skyscraper, and then all these point tokens that are going to be on this board here, and those will be acquired by the players for different reasons, and I'll cover those here in a second. So in this game, they give you a deck of 87 project cards. That's what these are right here. And then you have these contracts that are going to sit on this project board. And there are six of these foundation tokens. And we have some of them occupied on our board. But it's going to be six of them for a two-player game. And it gives you uh, the number, how many you have to put down for the number of players in the game. But we played it two-player, and it plays wonderfully. Uh, plays absolutely uh, fine at two player. I think it works well just the way it is uh, at whatever player count. So I'm not going to say that it would be better to higher player count. I think it would be just as fun. That's, you know, that's, that's something I can guarantee. And the way the game ends is when, in a two player game, when these foundation tokens have all been put on cards, the game ends immediately when the last one gets put on a card that's going to be put in this market space or when someone has completely filled their city board with project cards. Those two things end the game. So you have to kind of pay attention to what's going on because once it gets down to the last foundation token or you can see your opponent is closing in on finishing their board, you want to start making some moves to try to get as many uh, points as you can. This is a low scoring game. All of our games were what, 13 to 10, 12 to 9. 10 or 11. Yeah. All my scores. Yeah, so yeah, you're, you're, it's not going to be a lot of points. But the way the game works is we have all these project cards, a whole 87 of them, and this deck's going to sit right here by the project board. And you take turns drawing them and putting them in these three columns. Once you place that, it's my turn, I'll place that card. Your opponent's going to decide whether they want to take that card or do they want to take another project card off the deck and start making these rows a little longer. And once you start doing that, then the decisions become a little meatier and a little juicier because these cards all do different things. And you're trying to decide in your mind what you can accomplish with the cards that you're going to take. And you can double these up. You don't have to fill any particular row. You can double them up and make them tempting to your opponent. In this game, it's imperative that you watch what the person to your left is doing, and which in a two-player game is just the other player. But in a three-player game, everyone would have to watch the player on their left, and a four-player game uh, would be identical because you have to know what they're doing because you're leaving them. They're, they're choosing next. Once you place a card, they're choosing next. And it, I guess it does resemble an I split, you choose mechanism like in Hanamakoji. 
uh, which is absolutely a fabulous game. And I can't understand anybody not owning that little card game for $15. It's one of the best games I've ever played. But Hanama Koji had, gives you that same feel where you're going to take a card and put it down and then the next player is going to decide do I want those? Which And which do I want? Which of these three columns do I want? Do I want to take one of those and eat this contract? Because once you take this contract, then you can't take any more cards from this project board that are less than... They have to, you have to be more than the contracts you hold. So if you have one contract, there has to be at least two cards in one of these rows for you to take it. And once you have two contracts, there has to be at least three cards in one of these rows for you to take that row. So it kind of bogs you up a little bit when you get these. However, when the other players take, uh, make selections off the project board, then you, everybody loses a, one of these contracts. So you're never going to be stuck with them for long. But I did get behind in one of the games where I kept having two and, and Lori would have none. And so I, when you have two, I, I have to wait for three cards or I just have to gut it out until she takes one. And when she would, I would, then I would lose a contract and put it back. And I didn't want to get behind like that again. I felt kind of creepy. You know, I, I thought, this is really holding me back. You didn't lose, though. Because I, I had two contracts and she had none. So you're trying to decide when to take those. And then as these city districts fill up, there are bonuses to be had from this board. The first player to fill up a row, and there's a matching row on this city board, you would take the one point token for that particular row that you filled up first and that gives you a point and so everybody's racing to try kind of a racing thing too I mean to to fill this city board in these different districts because you get those points and then at the end of the game whoever has the most workers in their row and some of your cards will have workers on them and I'll explain how that works in a minute but whoever has the most workers in that row will take the two point token off of here so you're thinking about that also then, down here at the bottom of the board is a two and a half point token in a two, two to four player game. And whoever has the most trolleys built in their city of San Francisco is going to take that two and a half points. And that's a huge token. That's, that's really, a, that's the most points you can get in this game, two and a half. Yeah, that's the largest point token in, mm -hmm. this, in this game. So, let's back up a minute. When you're taking cards from here and you take a project card that you have the ability, it has a, a project card that has a foundation uh, space on it. And I'll show you one of those right here. So it's got a space that looks like that and the card looks like that. You're going to take a foundation tile from the board, put it on here like that and then place it in this row. Now when a person takes that, they'll put it on their board, but it's not built. They have to build that by putting seven workers that represented on different cards around that foundation token. Seven workers. So you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, where am I going to get the workers? Do I have the workers that have I, where should, when should I take that? Do, should I take it now? Am I going to be able to get seven workers around that in the position that I'm going to put that on my board? Or do, should I wait? and get some workers on the board first so that I can, like this, in this particular instance, Lori had a card with four workers on it. Once you get seven workers around that foundation tile, you're going to get a skyscraper to put on there and it's worth one point. And you get the master builder token for now because you, you may lose it. Now everybody else in the game, if you're playing multiplayer, but in a two-player game, your opponent would have to build two skyscrapers to take that one point master builder token. And then if you want to take it back, you'd have to build three. So you have to always build one more than the person that has the master builder token. But that one point token can make or win the game for you. So you're thinking about it while, while you're developing your strategy in this game. Some of these cards do different things. So I talked about a cable car network. You're going to get these cards that have rows with cables on them for the cable car to travel. When you get one of these, if it's connected to the cable car row that's at the bottom of your player board, like this card is, then you would put that cable car on there automatically. Now if you were to draw one of those cable car project cards and put it out in the middle of your city somewhere where it wasn't connected, you could not put a cable car on there. There are some cards that build depots 
on the other side of the board so you have to kind of watch for those and once you get one of those then you can com start coming from that direction with your cable cars but the person that has the most cable cars at the end of the game again gets two and a half point token so you're thinking about that also not only are you thinking about building your city rows first to get those one point tokens you're thinking about how many workers are in each city row to get that two point token at the end of the game you're thinking about how to deploy those workers so that you can build skyscrapers from the foundation tiles that you have on your board and then you're thinking about this cable car network also that you're trying to build so all of that is working its way into your strategy and then some of these cards do funky things like this card here most of the cards have one and two workers on them but at one two or three but this card has four workers but it has a picture of a cable car on it so a cable car network has to touch this card in order for those workers to count not only for your foundation tile that where you're trying to build a skyscraper but also for that city district row at the end of the game this wouldn't count for the four workers for your total at the end of the game in that particular row unless it touches a cable car network so you have to be very aware of that then also there's cards that have this uh, compass on them and those if you get two of them in one of your city districts then you're going to be able to take what that particular bonus from this city board and you can see these rows up here and it has things like you can add two workers in the seaside row or the parks row there's a, a stadium you can put and not only that but you can it has four workers on it and it's black and any of these cards that you draw a project card that are black like this one I just showed you you can place that anywhere it's wild so you can place that in any city district so you're thinking about those cards too so there's a lot to go on in this game and I was pretty impressed by it I've watched the play quite often before I decided and to be quite honest with you it was on the uh, sale at cool stuff here in Maitland they had a Christmas it was a Christmas in July they called it something like that something yeah. Christmas in July sale and I picked this game up for $18. I knew we would like it for a number of reasons, and I tell you guys all the time to follow good board game designers. Ryder Knizia, I, I mean, if, is there a better board game designer in board gaming? I, I don't know. Arguably, he's the best it's ever been. He's made so many board games, and they all seemingly, you know, not all, but most of them are absolutely wonderful. And I'm willing to check out his games because of his catalog of work, his body of work over the years. We have Amon Ray, we have Ra, we have Star Trek Expeditions, we have uh, Carcassonne the Castle, all by Reiner Knizia. We have some little games by him, uh, High Score and Don't Llama Dice, fabulous games. This guy really is a great board game designer, so I was willing to to take this game for $18. You know, it's not much of a gamble, and I'm glad I did. It's one of the best games of 2022, and you would love playing this, folks. I always say the best board game designers can take a few mechanics and make you work hard intellectually to make that game work, and that's what this is. San Francisco is a game where you don't have some big, massive components but you're going to think in this game and put this puzzle together in the best way that you know how to score anywhere, anywhere from 10 to 15 points. If you score 15, you're, you'd be kicking butt in this game. I mean, it's pretty awesome. I really, really enjoyed it. I knew I would like it, and that's why when I saw it was on sale, I said, hey, Lori, get that game, please. $18, yeah, let's do it. Because this is the type of game you can sit down and play. We, like I said, we just played it three times, and we got it done an hour and a half. Didn't we three plays, you think? Probably, yeah. You know, even with kitty yeah. interference, yeah. yeah. Cats were up here and, and uh, messing around. <laughs> we had to get them down. But uh, even with kitty interference, I think we got three plays in an hour and a half. And we like that kind of time frame because, again, not, not everybody can sit down and play a campaign game for 80 hours or whatever those require out of you. We enjoy games that we can get out of the box, put on the table, play them and put them back in the box in 60 minutes or so. You know, we don't strictly adhere to that, but that's certainly a target that we shoot for. And this is one of those games. It's a fun game to play. It's a fun puzzle to solve. And I think if you like games that are, you know, those types of games that have a uh, simply complex 
personality like this one does, you're really, really going to enjoy this. It's a keeper for us, that's for sure. I watched Rado play it, and he, he, he said Jen froze up because of the I split, you choose mechanism. He, he doesn't like that mechanism. I think it's one of the best mechanisms in board gaming. I like to see it more. When you are placing things down that you know, you know that someone wants. And so where, how do you do that to, the, to best help yourself? even though you know that, that your opponent is going to get something out of it also. So it, it, that's fun. I mean, there were times I would draw a card off this project deck and look at it and go, oh, because when you take that card, you look at what's already available and you're looking at your opponent's board and you're like, oh, if I give them, I, there's already a card down there they want. I can see that this, this card is going to give them a bonus and they're going to get one of these bonuses that's really going to help them out. And this card will help them too. Well, I don't want to give them two good cards. I'll put it over here, even though they may choose that row too. Because they're getting three cards, and maybe one of them they can use, and one of them they can't. So you're weighing those options continually every time you draw a card and place it in this project market. And... That is the fun in this game. And then, it, I don't care how hard you think about it, there's never a perfect decision. So don't, you know, you just can't sit there and be over analytical. 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 <laughs> analytical about your move. Because if you are, you're going to, you will freeze up. And no matter what you do, your opponent may do something completely, you know, completely different than you had been going over in your mind. Thinking, uh, well, I see what they're going to do. They're going to take that row of cards. And then they come out and take a different row. And you're like, oh, they had something completely, something else completely in mind. And I didn't even see that or I didn't think about that. So you can't make the perfect decision. So don't sit there and try. My point is just look at it. Make your best choice. Put it down and move on with the game. And it's a lot of fun that way. Uh, in Hanamakoji, same thing when we're playing that. You take a look and you're like, oh. You know, that's a real I split. You choose, you're going to, you know, you take two cards in this hand, two cards in this hand, lay them down, and your opponent gets to choose one of those two, and then you get the other ones. So that that, that game is just amazing with that mechanism. But this is awesome. Rana Kinesia, again, that guy, I don't know what to say. I have so many great games by him. Babylonia, I forgot about that, and Blue Lagoon. This guy continues to overwhelm me with his games. And you guys, I tell you what, if you like, this is a light to medium game for, this would be a game that would be complex for someone who doesn't play board games, but this is a light to medium game for everybody else. Read the directions, but you're going to do a lot of thinking in this game, and that's the fun part of San Francisco. So yeah, hey, enjoy your day, whatever you happen to be doing, and please keep on board gaming. It's the best hobby on the planet. Please take a second. Hit the thumbs up and subscribe for us. Give our videos a boost. We love every one of you. We love doing these videos for you. I love telling you about good board games. And I only tell you about games that I think you can buy with confidence. You're going to play and go, hey, I really enjoy that game. So yeah, San Francisco by Rainer Canizia, 2022. Have a great time. I'll see you next time on The Bones Collector. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. How you doing? And welcome to Bones Collector. And today, Lori and I just got done playing a game from 2020. And it's by Reiner Knizia, and it's called Sumatra. Now, Sumatra is a tile-laying, open drafting game. That's some set collection going on. And it's for two to five players, and the winning condition is the most points. So let's talk a little bit about the production of this game from Ludo Nova as the publisher. And I'll put this down here. And this has a really nice, sturdy box. I was pretty impressed with that. I thought, you know, it's an inexpensive game. And, and it has a really, really nice box, so uh, good uh, kudos to Ludo Nova for doing that. The tiles in the game that you use are very thick. This board could have been thicker. Yeah, right? That's probably my only complaint. Yeah. Thicker or thinner, one or the other. Yeah, uh, thicker. Because it's warping. <laughs> should have been thicker. And I think the player board should have been, they're paper. I don't know. But, but all the tiles are a good thickness, and the meeples that come with the game are microscopic. They're tiny. <laughs> So we use our own meeples. And, and I guess that brings me to the point of this is an abstract strategy game for the most part. And whenever publishers put those out, hey Ludo Nova, you know when you do these games, you, you need to make the production high. Because the game is, 
is simply complex, okay? The rule set is small and there's enough going on to keep your mind busy. It's a nice little puzzle. So you need to make the uh, components of the game top notch because that what is what gives an abstract strategy game legs. And they just missed it a little bit on this. But hey, it's a fun game and, and uh, we had a fun time playing it. But, uh, you know, that's, that's enough about the production, but the box is real nice. And I was impressed with that. Rule book is very nice, very clear, very easy to read. Uh, nice big, big font in the rule book. Lots and of I, examples. Yeah, lots of examples. And I just I hate small font in rule books, so that's very nice. Enjoyed that. And yeah, that's the inside of the bottom of the box. That's pretty cool. I can't show you the top of the box because my cat Gravy's asleep in it. And uh, Biscuits just got out of that one in time to make this video. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, they, they see box lids and they take a nap. So in this game, you're simply going to be open drafting tiles from down here at the bottom of the board. And this is known information, I guess, is what it's called. And up here is unknown information. It's lost. Lost. Lost information? The top is lost. Lost. So lost information. And you have a board here where you're going to move your meeples around, and your choices are going to be this. You can either draft a tile from down here or move your explorer from that space. So that's essentially what it is. But the thing is, and where the decision making comes in is you're trying to do certain things on your play area here on this board to score points and to do that you have you want to have the most tiles to choose from well if you move your explorer to a new space and there's a book of knowledge that follows the, all the explorers around and if you are the first one to move your explorer to a new space leaving behind some tiles at the bottom of the board that you didn't want, don't do anything for you. Uh, it has a number on here on every space and you get to draw that number of tiles out of this bag, a uh, big bag of tiles here, and put them at the bottom of the board and you get to choose first before anybody else. So that's kind of nice. So your decision making is boils down to that. Do I want to move and leave those tiles behind or, that, or are there still some good tiles down here that I want that are going to create some scoring opportunities for me in my play area. So that's essentially what you're going to be doing. And you have different types of ways to score and you have in-game goals that you're going to try to uh, get bonuses for and these big tiles here and then you have a bunch of these tiles like the first player to get pairs of something and, First player to get three uh, plant tiles, first player to get a pair of jewelry and a pair of people, and all of these are three points apiece. And you're thinking about these, there's quite a few of them, and you're thinking about them when you are, are selecting tiles to put in your play area in addition to the long-term goal of how you score at the end of the game. And there's different ways to score, I'm not going to get into all of that, but it's, I think it's rated like a 1.89 on Board Game Geek, I just looked. and I mean, it's a, it's a two game, yeah, two out of five as far as complexity is concerned, but there's enough puzzle here, Laura and I were talking about it, and we enjoyed the game very much. It's, it's right there with Blue Lagoon, and mm -hmm. if you like very that. Very simple, very quick. Right, Canisia. But some strategy. And will this game stay in our library? Probably. Because, you know, and I've talked to you guys and been very transparent about getting old and where time becomes more precious to you as you have little of it left you know you as you get older you have it diminishes the amount of time you have time is your most precious treasure you and you become very particular about how you spend it when you get to be my age so we like these little games where we can sit down you know i i have my tofu over there marinating getting ready to fire up my blackstone grill and put some veggies and tofu on there and and so we have other things that we do so these types of games where you don't really set the game table a long time are pretty nice for us at this point mm -hmm. in our life and this is one you will play it's uh, a lot of fun uh, we enjoyed it very much and we're going to keep it for a while for sure and play it some more and see what kind of legs this thing has but every game will be different because of the type of game that this is i talked about selecting these tiles mm -hmm. you have known information down here and those are the ones you're going to select and the ones that are left behind because maybe once you move to a new space everybody else is going to follow because they're like, I don't want any of those either. So once everybody moves, then the ones that are left behind here go up here to the top of the board and the, that's the lost information. Now when you put together these two tokens here, the GPS and the Wi-Fi or whatever it's called, and you get a pair of those, that automatically lets you select a tile from the top of this board. Because you find it with your GPS. Yeah, you find it, yeah. <laughs> and and th that's very important because you may 
need a backpack tile to complete uh, so that you can score your volcano, those type of things. And it may be up here in the lost, lost. information so that you can select that. So you see that up there and you're, you put a pair of those together and like, I need that tile really bad. <laughs> and it uh, gives you the opportunity to do that. So those types of things are going on in this game. And you've seen them before in tile layers. And this is just a nice puzzle by Ryder Kinesia. Uh, he does a great job with these types of little games. I mean, if you, if you haven't played Babylonia, you need to. And Blue Lagoon, we found it to be very fun. You can get a little aggressive in Blue Lagoon and cut people's paths off and so forth. Well, you can get aggressive in this yeah. one, too. And take, oh, yeah. take what you know I need. Yeah, yeah. If you there's see. only five volcanoes in the game. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah, there's five volcanoes. Five, and it shows you. Here, let me show you. So on your, on your player board... Here it has the uh, icon, icon for the tiles that go in that particular row, and it has how many of them are in the game. 12, 10, 9, 9, 10, 10, 5, 5, and 5 sets of 6. Let's see. 5 tiles. 5 of 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's 5 different backpacks, 6 of each in the game. And you have to have 3, and you see where it says 3 on there. You have to have three backpacks on that particular tile to score a volcano that you've put up in here. If you don't have a backpack, at least one in every one of these spaces, everything that in that row gets taken off the board before you start scoring. So there's that kind of puzzly thing going on in this game. And I, I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. It was fun, wasn't it? It was fun. And, um, you know, these are kind of paper. Now, I, I mean, if you I play this for 20 that years, that'll probably yeah. break in half. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I didn't have a problem with those. Yeah. But it's a fun game. It's a fun little puzzler. I want to talk to you about it today. That's really all there is to be said about it. I would suggest to anybody, if you like little puzzle games like Calico and, and uh, Cascadia and, you know, like I said, Blue Lagoon and What's the player uh, count? Reef. And the player count is two to five. Two to five, okay. And, and oh, I did want to mention also, I really appreciate this from Little Nova. There is two sides to this board. Oh, yeah. This side is for three to five players. This side is for two players only. Thank you. Thumbs up. You know, I complained about Babylonia having to reduce the board to one-third to play two-player, and I just hate when publishers do that. You've got a piece of cardboard here, put different player counts on, on each side so that the game... Hi, honey. Put, player, you know, different uh, player counts on each side of the board. They did that in this case. I applaud them for it, and I really appreciate when that happens, and I really get upset when it doesn't. So, yeah, that is Sumatra. Uh, by Ryder Kinesia, the best board game, you know, probably the most prolific board game designer ever. Uh, and he's got a nice little hit here, Sumatra. It's a fun time. So I'll see you next time on The Boats Collector. Make sure you please take a second and like our video. Sure does help out. I love every one of you guys, and we'll see you the next time. Keep on gaming. It's the best hobby on the planet because of games like Sumatra. Bye-bye.